Thanks, Kate. Um, next up on our list today um, is Lynn Anderson, Dr. Lynn Anderson from Covance, and she'll be speaking to us on the topic of um, life science logistics for lab animals. Thank you, Judy. So this presentation, and the title, in fact, is uh, taken from Chapter 12 of the Live Animals Re Regulations uh, produced by IATA. And so you'll, you've seen or heard uh, bits and pieces of this, but this is really just, a, I think, a, a nice summary of what, what you find in that um, Chapter 12. So as you've heard, mice and rats are by far the most commonly shipped animals, but uh, rabbits come in a, a, a close second. Uh, if I'm only talking about mammals, fish, of course, um, are, are, are very large numbers of fish are also shipped. And to a lesser extent, um, but still very important is how we ship our dogs and cats and many pigs and non-human primates that are used in biomedical research. <clears throat> so Kate just did a very nice presentation talking about health status and the things that you need to consider, whether the animals have a conventional health status or whether they are specific pathogen free, whether they um, are actually even germ free and, and have been associated with certain microorganisms or exenic. So I don't need to spend a lot of time talking about, about that. But what I do want to talk about, and I think all of these recommendations, quite frankly, are very common sense. They're very practical. Bob Fernandez talked about that a bit this morning during his presentation. And so um, it makes sense that, that you're not going to ship clinically ill animals. They're not going to they're not going to do well. It's it's stressful, and at the end of the day, they're not going to be useful for for your research purposes. However, if you have an animal that does have some type of abnormality or birth defect, birth defect to which they have adapted and that they're essentially normal, that they're not going to be stressed out um, as a result of that infirmity during shipment, then it's fine for them to be shipped. However, you do need to have a health certificate that recognizes what that condition is and the assurance from the veterinarian saying that that um, defect is not going to compromise the animals during their, their trip. Now, Kate also referred to um, species-specific agents. So animals that are infected with agents that are only manifested in that particular species and they don't cause illness, they, or maybe they cause it, but only under certain circumstances um, and, and not that frequently, those animals can be shipped, okay? But you need to question, are they going to be suitable for the end purpose, okay? So most of us that are working with rodents typically aren't going to want to deal with, with known pathogens, um, even though it's okay to ship them that way. And you also need to really think about the type of container that you use in shipping those animals so that they're not contaminating other animals that may be on the truck or on the airplane. Again, I know you've heard this in at least three presentations. It is up to the shipper, not the person or the company doing the shipping, to be responsible for the health of the animals. You have also heard that when animals are infected with agents of either human or agricultural significance, that you should not be shipping those animals. Most carriers simply refuse to, to handle them. But if you must ship them, then they're considered dangerous goods, and IATA has a manual that, that also helps to address that, which I'm not going to go into any detail here because um, it's just not very, very often done. You want to consider age. So it doesn't make sense to ship unweaned animals. The animals have a very difficult time uh, adjusting to the heat. They, um, uh, they're not able to, to generate the energy to deal with cooler temperatures. They also may not be adapted yet to, to consuming solid food, or they may not know how to drink from a, from a cup or from a, a, a valve. If you're thinking that you might want to put a, a lactating fe female in to, to help care for those unweaned or, or recently weaned animals during transit, you may find that those lactating moms refuse to provide care for their pups. Okay. Um, unless it's really close to, to weaning, um, even uh, 
animals that that are shipped with their their moms they just don't simply don't have the mobility or the energy stores to to adapt during transport and this does vary somewhat with species so generally if you have a little bit older more robust animal uh, uh, certain species also just just thrive better as, as weanlings um, you, you might be able to get by with it but alternatively what you might want to consider is to just simply ship a pregnant female um, in the first two, one, during one of the first two trimesters okay. you want to avoid shipping animals that are close to to term um, again uh, time-mated rodents may be an acceptable uh, situation, but even then there's, there's going to be risks. The problems you see are the mother aborting during transit, especially in the last trimester, or they may actually end up giving birth in transit, which would frankly just be a disaster. So if you're going to ship time-mated pregnant animals, try to do it in the first two trimesters. If you ship very early on, they, um, before the, the embryos have implanted, you may actually lose the, 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 um, uh, the, the offspring, and you may um, consider then shipping more in midterm in order to have, have the animals deliver at the, at the receiving institution. Okay. We also talked this morning a little bit about genetically modified animals. Okay. The non-infectious uh, disease conditions that you find in, in intentionally modified animals, they may have some problems. They may not be able to cope as well during transit. Um, they may not be tolerant of changes in the environment, or they may have very special requirements during transit, such as certain drugs or certain diets. So you need, in your journey planning, to consider those things. And you also need to think about the duration of the shipment. Is there a way that you can avoid having to intervene um, and, and provide those drugs during uh, transportation? And what can you do, especially around the, just before or just after the animals uh, arrive at their institution in order to accommodate for them? But in, in, in most of the cases, um, there is, if there's no overt disease, they can be shipped as, as normal animals. Bill also had talked about using frozen embryos in order to uh, avoid having to ship live animals, which is really a, a, a very good alternative and one that may be very helpful as we see uh, the, the opportunity and ability to ship animals by airplane diminished um, over time. Immunocompromised animals uh, need to be shipped in a container that will exclude and keep or keep out any type of microorganisms. Um, but other than that genetic susceptibility to infection and the fact that, that most of them have no hair coat that helps to maintain their, their heat, um, the requirements for these animals are generally the same as, as they are for any other animals. Obese animals have special considerations because they just can't deal with heat very well. And so what you would want to do is to probably reduce the density of animals in your container. It may require you to, to ship fewer animals per crate than you would ordinarily do during cooler times of the year. But you can still ship them. If you're shipping multiple animals in the, in the same crate or container, whether it's divided or non-divided, always stick with the same species. So even if you have a container with a divider down the middle, you cannot put rats on one side and, and mice on the other. It's very stressful for them. There's some predator-prey activities going on, and they will try to um, escape their, their containers. You also need to uh, separate species uh, to the extent possible to, during transit, but that's not always possible, especially during uh, air transportation. You just don't know what's going to be sitting next to your to your load on, on the airplane. You can't guarantee that they'll even be separated by sight or sound or smell, which is going to be very difficult for, for certain species that get very stressed out. And as Kate just nicely um, illustrated, there's always the potential contamination of the outside of the container, and you need to then consider how to decontaminate that when it arrives at your facility. Okay. 
some people, and I, and I know this from experience, are interested in having animals grouped together prior to, to shipping, even if they're not normally grouped together um, while, while they're in, in their breeding uh, environment. And what will happen, of course, is that they'll probably fight, and uh, you could end up with, with really substantial injuries, especially with larger animals. So it's best, um, if you're going to do any type of, of group, ho uh, group housing during shipping, you need to acclimate the animals. Uh, with rodents, this tends to be more strain dependent, as, as I'm sure many of you are aware that some strains fight more than others. So you may want to decrease the density of, of um, I'm sorry, you might want to increase the packing density because that actually helps to, to, to minimize the fighting. Um, with larger animals, again, you need to, to work through and establish social groups well in advance to shipping in order to make sure that they're not going to fight uh, during transit. Surgically modified animals. Okay. Again, it's going to depend on the type of surgery that's being done, whether it's a simple thing like a vac a relatively simple thing like a, a vascular access port or if it's more complex surgery, you need to ha allow adequate time for the animals to recover before putting them into their shipping, shipping crate. Um, in very minor procedures, this may only take a couple days, but if there's more extensive procedures, you're going to need to plan for, for a longer period of time for recovery. And if animals have, have any complications during that recovery period, they really should not be shipped. Now, again, in the, at the end of the day, they're probably not going to be worthwhile animal models for you. And if you have uh, animals that have been uh, instrumented with uh, uh, components that have uh, an exterior uh, part to them, then those have to be transported to individual containers or compartments so that their buddies won't get to them and start pulling the things apart. Okay. It's important to be aware that during transport there will be some changes in, in your laboratory animals. Typically the animals um, uh, have, have changes in their light cycles and food consumption patterns that are based on light cycles. They will often lose up to 10% of their body weight because um, they, they don't typically drink much during those, those first 12 to 15 hours of transit. And so when the animal arrives at your facility, it's important, of course, to make sure that they are hydrated, even though you're providing water during transit as prescribed by, by the regulations. <clears throat> this is particularly noticeable in larger animals, and so you just need to accommodate it for it upon arrival. You've seen some, some examples of, of shipping containers, it's important that you be able to view the animals and, and that um, they meet the standards for ventilation openings for, which are prescribed by the regulations. Okay. Now, up to now, almost everything's been very general that I've made comments about, but I do want to mention just a few things about non-human primates. These animals are all purpose-bred, that means that they're not wild-caught, and that they typically have either a conventional or a, a, what we call conditioned specific pathogen-free health status. They are very highly social, they're very, uh, they have very complex uh, behaviors, and they're very nimble and very intelligent. Therefore, it, you have to make really sure that your shipping container is such that they cannot escape. And, and this is really, it's almost a science to devise these crates so that, that uh, the animals cannot escape. If they do, make sure, and this is, it goes to, to the discussion this morning around training of personnel, you know, make sure that only trained personnel are, are attempt to capture them. These animals can be very dangerous and cause a great deal of injury, so that's a very important consideration as part of your journey planning. And finally, you need to make sure that the containers that they're in um, are designed so that you can provide food during transit and fill the water compartments during transit without actually opening the animal compartment, which gives the animals an opportunity to escape. Okay. Other container considerations include feed. Okay. Um, 
in in filters which are uh, contain I'm sorry in containers which house conventional animals you um, uh, want to allow food and water to be replenished if the shipment's going to be longer than 24 hours actually you need to provide water after 12 hours um, but that allows you to open up and, and somehow fill that compartment filtered containers however that are shipping specific pathogen free rodents must contain sufficient food and water to go for the entire length of, of, the, of the trip plus allow for some delays make sure that the food you're feeding is the same food that they're accustomed to you can provide fruit and vegetables however um, you need to take in consideration whether there's a uh, risk in crossing borders to having uh, there's there's many regulations that govern the, the movement of, of fruit and vegetables across borders so that may or may not be an option and generally speaking dry food is better so that it doesn't uh, um, become rancid or uh, decay over over the trip of the time of the trip you can put food on the bottom of the of the container for rodents because they like to forage but generally larger animals want their food presented in a cup and again just keep in mind that many animals won't consume much food in the in the first 12 to 24 hours of transit because their light cycles have been disrupted their sleep patterns have been disrupted and and they're feeling some stress because they're in a new environment water um, can be provided in bowls however it spills and it can be contaminated by the animal waste but it can be replenished during transit an alternative would be to provide some type of a container that's sealed either it's a bag or, or a bottle that has or that contains disinfected water but these are fitted with valves and the animals must know how to use them or you can provide a gel pack and you've seen some pictures of that earlier today and that's particularly good for for shipping SPF rodents and you can also add carbohydrates and other nutrients into the gel pack during transit you need to consider the environmental conditions lab animals are very adaptable and they can function over a wide range of ambient temperatures but they generally need to be acclimated for very extreme temperatures okay. some of the things to consider is how how well your your crate or your container insulates with how tightly packed the animals are so the amount of body heat that's being generated the size of the ventilation openings whether or not you have filters or some type of, of uh, covering over the openings that, that diminishes the opportunity for people to be viewing the, the animals unintentionally whether or not you provide adequate bedding material and what type of bedding material and then again what their exposure may be to wind and sun during their trip this picture by the way is, is a, uh, kind of staged it's a photograph of a, of a prototype that, that we've been working on so it doesn't have the typical um, uh, information on it that you should see on the outside of a container and as I said this uh, uh, presentation summarized chapter 12 of the life sciences logistics for laboratory animals and I am very indebted to, to Bill White for providing many of the photos that I used in this presentation and, and for providing me uh, the framework for the talk thank you very much <laughs>